Okay, uh, so uh, today is March the 15th, um, 2022, and we'll pay our homage to um, uh, two architects, and maybe a saint, Saint Nicholas, whose birthday was uh, today, uh, March uh, uh, the 15th in the year 2070 or 2072, but we'll see if we, uh, if I have the energy to talk about all three of them. I begin with uh, Joseph uh, Luiser. Uh, so let's read a little bit about him. So uh, he actually died on the 15th of March, 1983. That's the way I, I, I make these presentations. Uh, for those who died, I present them both on the day of birth. So I will present him also on, on uh, July 1st, but also on the, way, on the day when he died. And he died, as you see, March 15th. So he was a Catalan, uh, Josep, uh, Josep uh, Huiz, uh, Huiz, uh, Sir, I guess. Uh, e. Lopez, uh, a Catalan architect, was a Spanish architect, but uh, probably he would have preferred to, to be called um, a, a Catalan uh, architect and city planner. Born in Barcelona, Catalonia, Ser showed keen interest in the works of his uncle, the painter Josep Maria Ser, and of Gaudí. He studied architecture, the Escola Superior de Arquitectura in Barcelona, and set up his own studio in 1929. That same year, Sir moved to Paris in response to an invitation from Le Corbusier to work for him, in parentheses, without payment. Apparently, Le Corbusier did have this rather questionable habit not to pay. Returning to Bar because Doshi also was not paid, uh, so he took his revenge by uh, getting the Pritzker Prize a few years ago. Anyway, back to Sir returning to Barcelona in 1930. I guess he didn't work for too long for, for, for Le Corbusier because, you know, uh, if he moved to Paris in 1929 and he returned to Barcelona in 1930, you know, he only spent a few months or some months at the most, at the most one year in, in, in Paris. But he, you know, this very, um, news is kind of, you know, it makes me smile. In 1929, he, uh, uh, you know, he set up uh, his own studio and also moved to Paris to work for Le Corbusier. Anyway, we move on. Uh, so returned to Barcelona in 1930, he continued his practice there until 1937. During the 1930s, Sir co-founded the group Group d'Artist y Techniques Catalan per el Progrés de la Arquitectura Contemporanea, group of Catalan artists and technicians for the progress of contemporary architecture, which later became, with the addition of the Western and North groups, the Grupo whatever, again, a long name, which was in turn the Spanish branch of the Congrès Internacional de Architecture Moderne, SIAM. Uh, good advertising for uh, Jose Luis Ser, we have to confess. Sometimes later, Ser became president of Siam, 1947-1956. My God, uh, nine, nine years. He created several outstanding pieces of modern architecture do, during this period, such as the weekend house in El Garab, Catalonia, Spain, which I unfortunately I do not have here, the central dispensary of Barcelona, which I do, and the master plan for the city of Barcelona, which I don't. From 1937 through 1939, Sir lived in Paris, where he des designed the Spanish Republic's pavilion at the World's Fair, the Paris, uh, the Paris Exposition of uh, 1930 or Exposition of 1937. For the artistic content of the building, Sir called on his Spanish artist friends, Picasso, Miro, and Calder. Uh, well, Calder was not Spanish, uh, uh, was American. Picasso's contribution was Guernica and became the focal attraction of Serre's design. In 1939, having been disqualified from, from practicing as an architect in Spain, now I don't know why, maybe because of the Franco regime or I, I don't know. Anyway, ra rather radical. This is the first time I, I 
encounter such a case with, with, when an architect is uh, disqualified to, from practicing. Sir went, in, but for him it worked for the better. He went into exile in New York City, where he worked with the town planning associates, carrying out numerous urban plans for cities in South America. Pavilion of the Spanish, um, what is this? Uh, no, no, uh, something wrong here. This, this text should not have been here. Um, anyway, in 1952, Sir held a one year visiting professorship at Yale University. The following year, he became Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design from 1953 to 1969. Not bad. There, Sir initiated the world's first degree program in urban design, integrated the programs of architecture, planning, landscape, and urban design and taught many of today's leading architects. During this period, he served on the advisory board of the newly created Graham Foundation in Chicago, Illinois. These are the, his hands. I like his hands, you know, I, uh, they are expressive. Uh, hands are, uh, I think, important. They do say something about a person, I think. Um, maybe uh, close to what the eyes say about a person. The eyes and the hands do say something, and the shoes, I would say. Uh, anyway, I also like his shirt from the little I see here, you know, the little, little squares, you know, it, it's, it, it's kind of a sensitive shirt, it seems. This is the man, the Catalan architect, uh, and uh, another picture with him. I mean, it's the same picture, but, um, you know, you see the whole of it. And he's sitting on the famous uh, uh, Vasily chair designed by Marcel Breuer. Uh, OK, some drawings, only three drawings, uh, sketches, you know, nothing, uh, you know, uh, wow about them. But I think they show, uh, you know, uh, a certain sensitivity uh, and common sense. Um, yeah, sketches, hand drawn, of course. So now we'll go through his buildings, both from Spain and from the United States. The truth is, you know, he probably deserved a, a longer, pre uh, an ampler presentation than the one I have. Uh, I had one with his works out, outside of Spain because last year or two years ago when I presented him, Again, it was a Portuguese architect who talked about him, and then I just um, added some uh, some other works. Uh, but anyway, uh, you you'll have a comprehensive uh, uh, you know understanding of his works at the end of this presentation. 1930, 1931, uh, as a guiding mark, uh, Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier was built in 1928. So this was two, two three years later an apartment building in Barcelona. Uh, and I think it's good. I, 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 I think this, um, this uh, modernism, uh, you know, 90 years ago is still uh, uh, convincing and somehow fresh. I mean, if, if you do something like this today, it would be, uh, you know, noticed and published and all the rest, but it was built uh, 90 years ago. Interesting, this uh, corner, uh, you know, balcony, you know, with um, the door here and then it turns around, but it doesn't arrive you know, in front of the windows, it, it stops before it reaches the window with a potential um, door as well. And anyway, um, now uh, a boutique, uh, which is now a Rolex boutique, also in Barcelona, 1933, 1934, um, still elegant and, and I would say still uh, convincing as, as architecture, uh, nothing wrong with it. And uh, Rolex, I guess, uh, uh, took the right decision to, uh, to rent it or own it, or buy it, I don't know. 
Anyway, it's Rolex. Before it was this thing, I don't know, G Roca. Um, Now, uh, dispensary anti tuberculosis. Uh, so it's a dispensary, uh, well, you know, for, uh, for tuberculosis, kind of like a clinic, a hospital. Uh, modern, yes, modern. And uh, the language of modernity, you know, is easy to, to notice and to perceive. I mean, there are buildings today that are built uh, just like this, you know, with almost no differences at all. Not all of his works, uh, you know, make me very uh, affectionate, but uh, some do, and I will, uh, I will, I will say it when uh, we arrive at them. Another apartment building in uh, Barcelona, 1932-1936, Casa Bloc, but it's actually a you know, it's it's more than a casa. It's all these things, you know, a long block of flats. I guess with the entrances into the apartments from a long exterior corridor, which is uh, always, in my opinion, a good, a very good choice. It's a very good choice be, be, for various reasons, but one of them is that it allows cross ventilation in, inside the apartments. And uh, also this corridor could, the ex exterior balcony or corridor, uh, you know, uh, could function for meeting neighbors, talking, smoking a cigarette with them. Uh, you know, it, it could be beneficial to a more conducive kind of social life. So this is the this is the model of this casa, and the, here are the plans. So this is this is what I said. If you enter uh, the apartment through here, you have the kitchen, you know. Uh, with light from, from this side, and then you have the living room uh, facing the other way, you have uh, uh, cross ventilation, and it works very well. And so you have the, the bedrooms, uh, you know, with having uh, two a double orientation and very small uh, circulation. You see here, there are four bedrooms. So, you know, it's somehow a large apartment, but very little, uh, you know, uh, circulation. You know, because because of this, the, the exterior uh, access corridor to the apartments is very, very beneficial. I don't know why it is, pra it, it is in practice more often in our country. It should. Uh, I was told that because of the climate. What climate, you know? In England and the Scandinavian countries, this is, they do it all the time and they have a harsher. Plus now we don't have winter, so. Anyway, the pavilion of the Spanish Republic, Exposition Internationale des Arts et Technique de la Vie Moderne, 1937. It was rebuilt. I guess it was destroyed and it was rebuilt. Um, here it is rebuilt. Uh, I think it was rebuilt in, in, in Barcelona, not in, uh, not in Paris. It's okay, it's fine. I still like that redness. I hope that redness was uh, the original uh, choice of uh, Jose, uh, Jose Luis Ser. This is, uh, you know, this is how the building was rebuilt. I guess the, the Catalans, they like rebuilding. They also rebuilt the, the Miss Barcelona Pavilion. They rebuilt this uh, pavilion by Jose Luis Ser. Good, I, I think uh, it's good that they did so. Now, he also, because he was friends with Juan Miro and Juan Miro having a very successful career as a painter, he had plenty of money. So he commissioned his friend to build a, a, you know, a rather uh, luxurious uh, studio for him uh, in uh, where else, uh, Palma de Mallorca. 
uh, and this is the facade of the building. Uh, I don't know exactly what what kind of rendering this is, but uh, I see it signed uh, at the bottom by uh, Jose Luis Ser, and this is the building. Not bad. I wish uh, all artists in the world, the good ones at least, would have something like this, but uh, they don't most of the time. And certainly Vincent van Gogh didn't have something like this, but uh, Juan Miro did. And uh, also in a, in a beautiful place. I mean, uh, maybe so beautiful that you didn't feel like doing art any longer. Although I hope this was not the case. And I know it was not the case with um, uh, Juan Miro. And, you know, <laughs> not bad, really. I mean, uh, it would be a pleasure to have something like this and to paint and to paint and to paint, maybe smoke, maybe drink a coffee, maybe drink something else. Uh, yes, some artists uh, are doing well. It's not a very large building, but uh, still, <laughs> uh, it shows, um, you know, uh, it shows that there was success here for the painter. Now, you probably know that, uh, that uh, studios, art studios are discouraged to have, uh, to receive sunlight. They, you know, the functionalist uh, requirement is that the windows face north. But I don't think this is the case here. I see, I see some sunlight. Uh, I mean, I don't know, but uh, it doesn't seem to me that this is facing north. Anyway, Brinkush didn't have, uh, didn't have, uh, it was not, uh, his studio was not facing north either. And, uh, Although this might be north, but this is the other side. Anyway, here I don't have pictures, the Havana plan, plan Piloto, uh, but we go now, well, we go you know, indirectly in a way to the United States, because as we read, he was disqualified to, pra to practice as an architect. So he uh, uh, exiled himself to the United States. I guess he was extremely successful and influential because he was uh, commissioned to design an embassy and he was, um, you know, essentially an immigrant. Well, he designed a very nice building which unfortunately was abandoned in 1990. Uh, the embassy of the United States in Baghdad in Iraq from 1955 to 1961. I really like this building and I regret very much it was abandoned. Uh, I hope they will restore it or somehow, because I think he did a good job here. Uh, uh, here are pictures uh, from the time when uh, the building was, uh, was uh, used, was functioning. I wish I had better pictures. I only found the so-called better pictures with, uh, with the abandoned building. But no, I, I would have liked to see it um, you know, see more more of this building uh, while it was in good shape. Here is a rendering of it, but you you you'll have a you know an idea about what the building was about. Joseph Louis said, "Now here it is now, you know, uh, abandoned, uh, vandalized, uh, but who knows? Um, structurally, it seems it's still, uh, uh, you know." Uh, facing the elements, but uh, it's depressing, no? I mean, this was an embassy and now it's a ruin. Okay, now his own home, uh, uh, you know, he became the director of the architecture program at Harvard. So uh, his salary afforded him to build a nice home for himself from 1957 at Cambridge. Um, so 
it's modernism it's not a it's it's a, not an alarming modernism it's not a screamed modernism is a balanced uh, uh, modernism and he uses uh, also I, I like the fact that he uses uh, you know brick walls as well not just uh, you know I mean what to look at here this is you know kind of to be expected but um, the, I think he, he was a very good architect Joseph Brisser uh, yes, he lived very comfortably, as you can see, and, uh, you know, uh, enjoyed life as an academic and as an architect, uh, you know, and even nature, of course, because we look at a building which is surrounded by trees, so um, we can only envy him, right? This is the, the plan of his own home. So there is space around the building, but also a courtyard. Um, a rather modest garage for only one car, <laughs> you know, and I'm happy he was happy with just one car. He didn't need many, like even today, unfortunately. A very, uh, very pleasant interior indeed. I mean, you know, nothing extravagant, but uh, it shows good taste and uh, well controlled, uh, uh, you know, uh, opulence. Um, The truth is, if you study the work of someone like him, you might fall in love again with architecture and even with a certain kind of modernity, like mid-century modernity. Because it, there is optimism here, you know, not a, not a, you know, an extravagant form of optimism, but there is optimism. There is humanity in this architecture and uh, maybe we need more of it. Um, It's kind of a moderate modernism, uh, a center for the study of world religions, 1958-1960, Harvard Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Another good building, I would say. And I, I like the fact that it, it is not I, I ideologized. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an educational building uh, meant, built for uh, the conjunction, uh, the unity of all religions, and uh, it doesn't uh, assume any kind of uh, ideological narrative to, you know, uh, impress you with the uh, so-called sacred. No, it's a, it's a building which modestly uh, functions as a gathering place for the study of, uh, of religions. Center for the Study of World Religions. Um, And I like the fact that it has a certain dom uh, domesticity, the building is not you know, imposing uh, as an institutional place. It's, it's rather modest and uh, 
there is a certain level of domesticity. Now, uh, Smith, Smith Campus Center at Harvard University, 1958-1965. Now, this is uh, more like it. I mean, what I mean, it's more like, a, you know, a big university building, but it's well designed and, you know, with vertical windows, uh, with a certain musical um, treatment of the facades. You know, the, the facade is nice. Uh, you know, modern, but uh, done with a certain sensitivity. He was able, I think, to, to, to bring from Europe a certain sensitivity which didn't leave him. And uh, some other architects could, didn't succeed in doing this. He, he did. You know, all this fragmentation of the, of the facade testifies, I think, to something so-called European. Now, the Fondation met in St. Paul de Vins in France, uh, an art gallery or museum, 1959-1964. Uh, it's similar in a way with a um, with studio he built for Juan Miro. Now, yes, certain people might question a little bit this uh, rather exalted, uh, you know, parts of the uh, top of the building, but uh, they also had an interest to the building and, uh, you know, I, they probably also have a, a function beyond function, meaning, uh, you know, maybe a certain, I guess it could refer to the, the, to the aspiration towards the above of art or the, you know, the, the lofty ideals of art, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's the, it's the termination at, at the top of the building. It's, it's like a hat, it's like a coiffure. Here is a sculpture by Alexander Calder, the North American sculptor who was actually an engineer, but an excellent, an excellent sculptor. Joseph Louis Serre. Uh, Sorry about this picture. Here is the model, um, a larger, you know, larger version of the model, but it's still a model. He was good working, uh, you know, in a in a warmer climate, uh, in a kind of close to the, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, I, I think he, his sensibility, because he was born in uh, Catalonia, uh, made him. Uh, you know, uh, sensitive to, uh, you know, like here, Ibiza and, uh, you know, what we saw before, uh, Palma de Mallorca and even the Fondation Met. And, and, and what was good also, he brought something of that light and that spirit also to the United States, even to, you know, around Boston. I mean, you know, uh, Northeast, uh, part of the United States. A hotel abandoned in Ibiza, Spain. No, this, wait a minute, this, I, this is strange because I guess the, you see, I, you, I have to be careful with the images I found. I found this image under the name, the abandoned, um, you know, embassy in Baghdad. Well, I'm more inclined now to think that it's rather the abandoned hotel in Ibiza in Spain and not the, uh, not the, the Baghdad uh, embassy. It does look more like a, like, a, uh, like a hotel now that I look more carefully at it. And plus I see uh, the other images. So uh, this is the second building that was abandoned, built by Joseph Louis Serre. Um, here the artists were, you know, inspired to attack the building with their graffitis, and I think that's a good thing, but what is not good is what we look at here. Um, yeah, what can we do?
if this was in Ukraine, we would have known why it looks like this, but it's not in Ukraine. The vandalism of war is, is to me unacceptable and incomprehensible. Eastwood and Westview apartment complexes on Ro Roosevelt Island in New York from 1969, a very nice uh, large uh, housing complex. Um, he, yesterday I showed the, some works, uh, by the way, of Marx, Marxist architecture in Belgrade, and uh, I seem to see, uh, I, I, I see. I, I see a certain uh, resemblance with what was built in uh, uh, New Belgrade. Uh, maybe there were some influences coming from Joseph Luisel. But look at this. These are best, very masterly done. This, the, the elevation of these large buildings, you know, the way he you know, punctured the facade, the way he, you know, it's an animated facade. It has a a certain sensibility that that um, makes the building, uh, uh, I don't know, alive and interesting. Although you know, essentially, it's a prison. Good works, even the towers. I think they are they are done very very skillfully. So these are on Roosevelt Island, uh, part of New York City. The truth is uh, mid-century, uh, mid-20th century had good architecture. Uh, I mean, of course it had also bad architecture, but there was a modernism then that which is still valid uh, today. So this is Roosevelt Island. Somehow this looks more like Europe than the United States. Uh, well, this one, okay, but uh, the previous image uh, does, uh, does have something European about it, which is uh, surprising considering it's in New York, even if on an island. And you see the way he treats the, uh, you know, the, 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 there is also a, an ornamentation. And, and this, this aspect I like that, you know, he is not happy with just uh, brutally having some uh, blank uh, walls. You know, he creates a, a texture and, a, you know, a design on, on, on that surface. So this, even if you uh, at first do, don't, do, do not analyze it or notice it, you understand that there is here a different sensibility. How many people would do something like this, you know, uh, approximately mid century, 20th century, or you know, early 60s? Not many. This is ornament here. Let's, uh, let's name it. It's ornament. And he's a modern architect, not only that he's a modern architect. You know, he, he ran uh, Siam for uh, a rather good number of years. Now, Carmel de la Paix, this is, uh, I think, uh, part of a monastery, 1971 in France. Uh, you see here, well, you know, you see a fragment of the plan. Um, this is, a, you know, it's like a citadel on top of a, of a hill. Uh, I wish I had more pictures, but uh, interesting work again. You know, it's, it's austere, but also sensitive. He uses concrete, yes, but 
No, no. The more I contemplate his work, the more I like it. And it, maybe because he also was, he was, he was an architect, but also also an urbanist, so he was aware of the, you know, the relationship between, uh, you know, uh, uh, the rooms within a building and between the buildings around on on, on you know around the street or around the square. So there is this relationship between uh, fragments of uh, parts of buildings and, and the whole. So it's like, a, you know, a, a, a small citadel in a way. Sorry about this. Uh, that's what I found. Uh, there, there isn't uh, much to, to see here, nor here, uh, these drawings. Uh, Harvard Science Center. Harvard University. Now these are a little bit different. 1973, you know, uh, this is a confident architecture for a confident university for confident students. And uh, I, I don't like this building so much as what I, we saw on on the Roosevelt Island. Uh, it's you know still a terraced building, but it seems colder to me than what we saw previously. Maybe he was getting older. This is also possible. Um, yeah, Harvard University. I like more those works where there was an influence coming from the Mediterranean Sea, from Barcelona, you know, that it was the Baghdad the US Embassy or even the, you know, his own home and the, and the housing on Roosevelt Island. Anyway, he built this. I don't know what if he did this too, I guess he did. And this looks interesting from above, but I don't know if I have pictures, you know, from the level of the, the Radcliffe archives is, you know, this picture was part, is part of that archive. And we saw this one. Now Fondacion uh, Juan Miro from 1975, uh, this is actually his studio, so, uh, or no, it's different. This, this is actually his studio, but um, I guess this image I should not have he had here, I'm sorry. This is the foundation. So he built both the studio of Juan Miro and the foundation Juan Miro. And what the artworks that we look at here are just artworks by uh, Juan Miro. Yes, the building is different from the studio that he built for Juan Miro. So the Puiser, again, a sculpture by, uh, not by uh, Juan Miro, but by Calder. Alexander Calder. You can find at the uh, secondhand bookstores in, in Bucharest, a very nice uh, album uh, with uh, sculptures of Alexander Calder uh, written by um, Dan Haulika, who met uh, Calder and it's a very nice book and uh, it costs almost nothing. So I, I suggest if you are interested to, to purchase it with a few lay, you can have a nice art book with the works of an excellent sculptor. So the, this building is larger than the studio of Juan Miro. It's a foundation. Maybe by that time Juan Miro died. I don't know, but uh, it's it's a museum, all right. You know. I don't know. I, I I find it a little bit less. Something is missing here. It's that fragmentation that the small elements seem to be a little bit less present. Maybe modernism in its uh, dogmatic form um, you know, began to influence him, I don't know. It's all this concrete, uh, these surfaces, but anyway, here is a picture of him and Juan Miro. Uh, Miro on the left.
sorry about uh, those uh, authorship uh, words there. That's it. And now we go to the second architect who is connected with this day, a uh, German architect. This is a short presentation. Um, I couldn't find, uh, but uh, you will see a very important work by him, uh, uh, a church in Dresden, which was bombed, not by Putin, but by the, by, uh, well, maybe it was, yeah, it's possible it was, it was bombed by the Russians, but in the Second World War, and then I guess maybe we could say there was some justification, as opposed to what is happening now in Ukraine, which is totally unacceptable. Um, so George Barr, um, let's read a little bit about him. Uh, so he was born on the 15th of March, uh, and uh, he was a German architect, born in 1666 and died in 1738. Uh, this was the man. Let's read a little bit about him. He was born into a poor family in Fürstenwalde, now a part of Geising, Sax Saxony, the son of a weaver. The village priest, however, helped pay for his education. I don't know if I pronounce well with that, that uh, A with that uh, those two little dots above whose name I always uh, forget. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, anyway, you probably can. The one who you could see the, the the text was able to become a carpenter's apprentice in Launstein, in Saxony, in 1690. 90, he went to Dresden to start work as a carpenter. His dream was to go to Italy and see the famous buildings there. So in his spare time, he studied mechanics, calling himself both an artist and a mechanic, and designing not only castles and palaces, but also sketches of organs. Interesting. In 1705, age 39, he was named Dresden City Master Carpenter. Although he did not even have a master carpenter's certificate. One of our main goals was to modernize the city's churches. He believed that the existing buildings did no justice to Protestant church services in particular. Again and again, we see that important architects always want to bring something new. Why is it so? Well, it's normal. You know, it's normal. You want to bring life in. You cannot just repeat what was done previously. So he wanted to modernize the city's churches. His first building was the parish church in Lushpitz area of Dresden, a building in the shape of a stretched out octagon completed in 1708. The Dresden Orphanage Church was built around 1710 so, you know, a little more than 300 years ago, followed by the Trinity Church uh, in that place and the Ore Mountains, 1713 in the, this area, Ore Mountains, 1713, 1716. Between 1709 and 726, the Church of Forheim was built, as well as more in Königstein, Stein, Hostenstein, God, all these. Uh, uh, little towns in Germany intimidate me with their names and a considerable amount of housing in Dresden. I couldn't find pictures of those housing. I would have been very, maybe they are not, they do not exist any longer because Dresden was heavily bombed in the Second World War. But Bar uh, is most famous for designing the Frauenkirche, Frauenkirche in Dresden. He was given the task in 1722. In 1726, the design was approved and work began. From 1730, he became the first in Germany to go by the title of architect. While working on the, the Frauenkirche, Bar also oversaw the building of that, <laughs> that Kirche in Dresden designed by Pöppelmann. George Bar did not live to see the Frauenkirche completed, he died in Dresden, age 72, and was buried in the church vaults. In 2004, a memorial was built to him in the castle at Launstein, where he learned his trade. 
uh, there is a street, but I don't know where uh, with his name. And uh, let's look at, uh, at this most famous work by him, which was rebuilt after being heavily destroyed during the Second World War. This is the building. And I think the Germans did a great job at rebuilding it, you know. This is not, this was not an easy job, but they did it. Uh, and uh, it looks impressive, even rebuilt. Um, we'll see pictures also, you know, destroyed by the, the, by, by the deadly bombings. An important church in uh, an important city, Dresden. And it was built by uh, this architect, George B. A. with those two things above, uh, H. R. I have to learn once and for all, it's embarrassing. I, I'm a lecturer and I don't know how to pronounce a name. This is unacceptable. Um, I love this old picture, you know, this is from 1880. So it's from 142 years ago. It's, this is how the church looked in 1880, 142 years ago. I mean, you can, you can tell, you know, do you see any car here? No, uh, but uh, the quality of the photograph is incredible because that's why I'm able to show these, uh, these details. You know, it's, it's, it's the building, the building uh, as it was before it was destroyed and you see what is around it. The city was, uh, you know, very well configured, uh, you know, uh, great European uh, turn of the century um, uh, city. This is the plan, an octagon again and again, the octagon is, uh, is magical. And, um, you know, you can uh, very easily draw an octagon by uh, starting with a square and then, uh, uh, the same square with the same side you with, and with the same center, you rotate at 45 degrees and then you connect um, the corners and you get the octagon, uh, which has a very rich uh, symbolism. And by the way, Leonardo da Vinci loved octagon and the octagon was very present in his sketches. Uh, he didn't build, uh, he didn't build buildings, but he has, uh, you know, a certain number of architectural studies or sketches where he does employ the octagon. This is how the building looks like now after it was rebuilt uh, greatly, I would say, uh, you know, uh, considerable work here. To rebuild a cathedral like this, a church, they did it, the Germans. Uh, you see how uh, how it looked like uh, after the Second World War, and how it looks like now. Uh, amazing uh, transformation, isn't it? Why is it that we cannot stop having wars? Why? Why is it that Mr. Putin provoke provoke this tragedy now? Why? Why? I don't understand. I really don't understand. He's approaching the end of his life. He claims he is a believer, you know, he goes to the church. People die every day because of him. And because of other people as well, but he has a main uh, important role in, in this tragedy. And look here. You know, uh, this this is from not all, not too long ago. You know, like uh, uh, less than eighty years ago, the Second World War. This is how Dresden looked like at the end of the twenty, uh, at the end of the Second uh, Second World War, and this this is the church that we saw pictures of in 1880, which didn't look at all like this. Uh, 
I guess someone has to send to the Kremlin an album with ruined buildings in the Second World War addressed to Mr. Putin. You know, uh, make him think what he does. Look, this is Dresden at the end of the uh, Second World War. It's death, that's what it is. And less than 80 years later, the tragedy is repeating itself with the help of uh, enlightened um, uh, leaders. Sorry about the resolution of this, uh, but you can still see it a little bit, especially if you have better eyes than I do, and I hope you do. You saw the bigger, uh, you know, uh, image of the plan. Um, a good, a very important building uh, by this architect. Please be kind of turn off the microphone unless unless you want to say something. Thank you. Uh, we are approaching the end of this presentation. I just showed two other churches like him. Please turn off the microphone. Thank you. So on the left, the building destroyed. I don't know, the picture was maybe in the 50s taken or so. And then on the right, you know, Dresden was part of, uh, of uh, Democratic Republic of Germany. And you see here some cars, even a Trabant, I, 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 I see. Anyway, they rebuilt it beautifully. I don't know when it was rebuilt, actually. Was it rebuilt by the uh, Democratic Germany or probably so? But they did a, a great job. And here is the silhouette of the of the of this very nice city, Dresden. You know, uh, it's possible that this was a picture from uh, before the war. And uh, yeah, now we, we look at another church. I show two more churches, smaller churches like a village uh, church. This one, um, you know, colorful and cozy. The same architect who was born on the 15th of March. I like this redness on, on the walls of the church. Very nice. Why shouldn't the church have a sensuous color on its walls? Why not? I think it uh, brings hope and life. Uh, and uh, I like it like this. Why should the old walls be white, even for a church? The interior is more subdued, of course, but uh, the exterior is rewarding. Another church, 1719, 1726, so 300 years ago. I couldn't find many pictures with his work, uh, but, uh, you know, I, we, I, we still paid homage to him today. Uh, this is also interesting, you know, rather almost modern because of its um, simplicity. Very different from the big church in Dresden, but uh, still, I would say, uh, a good architectural work. And a model, <laughs> maybe made for uh, St. Nicholas Day or something, you know, it's uh, rather, maybe it's made of chocolate, white chocolate. Uh, well, part of it white. I don't know. Anyway, and now this is, I think, the last work I show. Another kirche, another church. Well, no, because I couldn't find pictures. I should have remembered that the last entry um, was without pictures because I couldn't find them. So let's wish him happy birthday. And um, 